Sir? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, uh, yeah. thank you, Leader. I've got uh, a couple of questions. I want to, you know, refer to Section 2A, 2B. Uh, you know, in my neighborhood, we've had a lot of problems. People leave their guns in their glove box. They leave it in the console. Some of them even just leave them out on the seat. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have people traveling through our neighborhoods at night on the weekends. They don't have to break in cars. They, they, they're just checking door handles. And most of the time, you know, in my neighborhood, thank goodness, you know, you, you don't feel like you have to lock the door or lock your car door or house. But they leave that firearm in there and, you know, it's, it's stolen. And, you know, the person who owned the firearm, they're a law-abiding citizen, but then it gets in the wrong hands, unfortunately. So, uh, and we've, I think we've had bills over the past two years from both sides of the aisle uh, from Memphis legislators trying to address this issue. But in your section I, I referred to, it says that the firearm or ammunition being stored in the motor vehicle is to be kept from ordinary observation and locked within the trunk, glove box, or interior of the person's motor vehicle or a container securely affixed to the motor vehicle if the person is not in the motor vehicle. But there is no language specifying what the consequences will be for individuals who do not store their guns as mandated in the legislation. According to law enforcement, many of the guns being stolen from cars are clearly visible from outside of the car, and many are stolen from cars that are left unlocked. Are people who leave guns unsecured in unlocked cars going to be held accountable for breaking the law, i.e., you know, we can make a deterrent of increasing sentences for the people who steal the gun, but... You know, let's cure the cancer before it's cancer. Let's stop it before it, it goes there. So what, what say you? Leader Lambert, you're recognized. To my friend from Davidson County, thank you very much for highlighting that section. Uh, again, I have for years encouraged folks to keep their firearms properly secured in their vehicle. Uh, I have also been vehemently opposed to bills that criminalize victims of crime. You know my background. I used to be an assistant district attorney. I'm now in private practice. And when someone has been the victim of a thief, they've already been victimized. To criminalize being a victim is wrong, in my opinion. Now, in this bill, it still does have the language in there that uh, requires in that section for folks to absolutely follow that. It does not have a criminal penalty attached to it, and I humbly do not think that it should. There are some county ordinances, I think, that cover some of that, but as far as in the state law, uh, to my knowledge, I don't believe there's a criminal penalty attached to that section. Um, so it is something that we certainly recommend um, to citizens, keep your firearms secure, keep it out of sight, um, and that way you're not in any way uh, enticing a thief to try to break out your window or some way break into your vehicle. Um, I, again, would encourage folks to lock their vehicle, regardless of what is in there, but especially if you have a firearm in your vehicle, uh, but simply because someone doesn't hit the clicker when they're headed away from their car because in a hurry, or because, quite frankly, a thief claims that they didn't. That's kind of been my issue with that for years on criminalizing victims of theft, is that your star witness in a case like that, again, just as a former prosecutor, is going to be the thief that stole the gun. It's real hard for me to put a thief on the stand and say, hey, was the car locked or not? It, so that's a very problematic provision to try to criminalize victimhood. Um, I will say that having your gun stolen, and I say this as someone who has been the victim of home burglary and vehicle burglary, um, it is something that leaves an impression on you. It is something that to this day, I live in a very rural community where you would think a lot of folks leave their doors unlocked. Uh, we do not. We lock ours up securely because I've had someone break into my home when I was a child, and there's nothing that quite leaves an impression on you like having your piggy bank busted open all over the ground and seeing the shards of it scattered across your bedroom to let you understand just how violent that is for a thief to steal what you have. So in this bill, we go after that true cancer, which are those thieves that are stealing our firearms or any other of our belongings. That's where I want to keep the focus. I hope that answers your question, sir, and thank you to the gentleman from Davidson County for asking it. Representative Mitchell, you recognize, sir? Yeah, th and thank you. Uh, and I've also paid stupid tax in my neighborhood for leaving my car unlocked, and they, they got an old laptop that wasn't quite worth their time, but, you know, I still had to replace it. Uh, in, in Tennessee, we have over 3,200 Tennessee gun permits have been revoked since 2010. Half of those revocations have occurred in the past two years alone. 
uh, in 2018 alone, 1,001 were revoked. Uh, don't these numbers uh, mean that we should be doing more to screen and train people who want to carry in public? Because, I mean, we're obviously, you know, you know the reasons for most of uh, a lot of these revocations, a lot of them are domestic violence related. Uh, so what? why should we not keep doing what we're doing to try to keep the safety of the public? Leader Lambeth, you're recognized, sir. Again, in the bill, um, virtually everyone that you mentioned that is not supposed to have a gun, it increases the penalties of those individuals. So felons, uh, domestic abusers, I mean, the, those folks that are not supposed to have a gun, especially violent felons, felony drug offenders, possession of a handgun by a felon, unlawfully providing a handgun to a juvenile or allowing a juvenile to possess a handgun, all the penalties on those individuals go up. So those individuals that have had their handgun carry permit revoked, most of them will fall in those categories and we're increasing the penalty on them. Now, again, the bill doesn't change anything on who can actually possess a firearm. That's still in the law, both state and federal law. What it changes is those that fall outside of the category that you just mentioned that are lawfully allowed to possess a firearm. We are simply saying that they don't have to have a permit. They're otherwise lawfully allowed to. They would fall outside of the parameters of the group that you just mentioned. Um, those are the people we're talking about. We're not talking about those that have had that would have had their hang and carry permit revoked. Representative Mitchell, you recognize? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I take representing my citizens very seriously, as do the representative from Knoxville and all my colleagues here on, on the uh, panel today. Uh, and you know, I two years ago I had to I had to step in front of a a crowd after the Parkland, and it was a group of uh, sixth graders came came up here that day, and I had to speak in front of that crowd. I think that's the only time I've ever lost it speaking to a group. And when when a little kid asks you, you know. How, how I'm going to keep them safe, and and we're and we weren't doing anything, and in fact we're we're I think jeopardizing the, jeopardizing them even more now. But Tennessee has one of the worst gun violence problems in the entire country. There's 27 states now that more people die from guns than they do automobile accidents, and of course Tennessee is one of those. We're ranked 11th in the nation for gun death, 6th in the nation for gun homicide, and 3rd for youth gun homicide. Uh, data show that states where weaker permit systems or no permits experience higher rates of gun death and gun homicide. How is allowing people to carry guns without permits going to reduce those numbers, i.e., shouldn't we be trying to... to go the other way, or are we just trying to get number one in all these categories? Leader Lambert, if you want to answer that. I'd be more than happy to. So the representative from Davidson County, um, of the two of us, I've lived this, you know that. I mean, I have spent a significant portion of my career um, focused on trying to make sure that our communities are safer. This bill makes our communities safer, period, 100%, without question. Until they make police officers small enough to carry around in your pocket that can protect you 24 hours a day, this bill is needed. And so a law-abiding citizen exercising their Second Amendment right makes their community safer. A thief, a felon, a domestic abuser, any of the folks that the penalties are increased on in this bill, especially those dangerous felons, those individuals need to be in prison and in prison for longer. That's what this bill does. Now, I understand that you're focused on just the C misdemeanor that we're taking off the books, but it's a traffic ticket. That's what we're taking off the backs of law-abiding citizens, a C misdemeanor. So, again, if you take the bill as a whole, I'm absolutely certain that taking away that C misdemeanor off of law-abiding citizens does nothing to make our state more dangerous. The statistics that you have cited um, can be spun in just about any way, and I know that you're not doing that. You're just putting the statistics out there, as you always do, and I appreciate that. But when you cross-reference that for gun ownership, which is what that a lot of times actually does coincide with, what you're really saying is you just don't like guns. And I know that's not your personal opinion. I'm not, I'm not trying to impose that on you. But many folks that share those statistics out there say, well, if you had fewer guns, you'd have fewer gun deaths. I can't argue with that, but that's not the way our, our nation was founded. We have a Second Amendment right. You have a right to bear arms. You have a right to possess that gun. 
until you get to the point or other folks get to the point where they want to ban all firearms, unfortunately, you will have those that misuse those tools, those weapons, just like we have individuals that will become intoxicated and get behind the wheel of a vehicle. We don't ban vehicles, but we do go after the individual who's intoxicated within that vehicle and try to separate them from that vehicle, sometimes by imprisoning them. And when they do it over and over again, we imprison them for longer. That's what this bill does. It goes after the bad guys and it leaves the good guys alone. Representative Mitchell, you recognized? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Folks, if you'll keep the happiness to a, and, minim a and, minimum, you recognize right And as Mitchell. you know, I, I grew up in a rural area. I grew up with many guns in our house. We, we had all 12 gauge, 20 gauge, 16 gauge, 410, you know, 30 out 6, 30 30. We had all kinds of hunting, hunting weapons. Uh, we didn't have any handguns. I ne we never needed that for hunting. You, if, if you can hunt with a handgun, you're pretty good, I, I guess. Uh, but today is a perfect example, uh, Leader. You know, as you said, it, it's, it's the extremes on either side. You know, today we didn't, we didn't have a bunch of people show up with their handguns, with their handgun permits out front. We had people show up with assault weapons uh, to make their point. We we had people show up. We had people show up. You know that our our state troopers had to go out and confront that were carrying weapons of war. You know on our streets of Nashville, uh, and they can laugh. They can laugh, but you can just look. You know if you'd looked at the young man and and the family he grew up in, his family had a you know, a great crane business, uh, you know, but he was sick. And, and he, his father, you know, father loves his son. You know, he, he gave him his guns back. Well, well, that son came on down here to Nashville, right. and he went into a Waffle House one night. Exactly. All right, folks. Uh, one minute, Representative Mitchell. If you fo Rep Representative Mitchell, one minute. If you folks, I, are, Representative Mitchell. Representative Mitchell, hold up. If you folks will keep your applause, your emotions to a minimum, and Representative Mitchell, if you'll keep your comments on the bill rather than the people that are attending, you're recognized, sir. And I'm very much on the bill. You know, when people are burying, burying people in Davidson County, that, that's my problem. And I just don't think we're getting, getting any solutions to that. You know, no one's ever stopped my family from having any of those guns I named. And I've never felt like I needed to walk up and down the street or go out to dinner and have a gun or, or anything by my side. You know, my grandfather was a sheriff of Dixon County for years. So I've always supported law enforcement. But this isn't supporting law enforcement. I'd hate, I'd hate for any of my family members to be in law enforcement because now they have no idea. They've got to make a judgment call and then you've got other people in a live shooting situation which a trained officer is only 16% accurate in a live shooting situation. Now we're going to have several people who think they need to participate with our law enforcement and I think that's causing a problem. I know you have the best of intentions. I've got the best of intentions. And I, I'm tired of kids having to go to school and to have active shooter drills in our state. Thank you. Leader Lambeth, you recognize, sir. To, again, to the representatives from Davidson County, thank you for your comments. I truly appreciate them. And I join you in trying to eradicate evil. Um, when we figure that one out, we'll have really done something. Now, until we do, we have to deal with the fact that it exists in this world. And fortunately, law-abiding citizens exercising their Second Amendment rights all throughout this country every day take out bad guys that are bent on murder, and mayhem. And thankfully, those folks have a right to bear arms. This bill only involves handguns, so I am glad that you referenced long guns. Uh, we'll use that vernacular for purposes of this conversation. This involves handguns. And so the other issues that you mentioned, or any issue that you mentioned with long guns, um, this, this bill does literally deal with handguns. So I did want to highlight that. And also to say that while I may disagree with you at certain points, I share your zeal again to make our community safer, and I am confident that this bill does so. 
Representative Sherrill, you're recognized, sir.